Shavu Tov everyone, and we are in Parashat Mishpatim, very important parasha because it's the sixth one and the last one of the six of the six weeks of the Shavavim. Okay, the M of the Shavavim, that's Mishpatim. What does it mean Mishpatim? Mishpatim means laws, which means if you uh, live in Israel, you go to law school, you go to study Mishpatim. Okay, very simple, and the most of the parasha, very boring, it's the laws of damages, basically. Human, whatever, we'll see. We'll go into it, and the, uh, a lot of the Talmud is based on this parasha. Okay? And we'll see. Now, we, where, where can we find parashat Mishpatim? This is in, in Exodus chapter 21, verse 1. That's where it starts. And it starts with the words, And these are the laws you put in front of them. Verse 2, As you buy a Hebrew slave, which is a whole story by itself, that's what you do. And all of this stuff of a, basically civil law, all of what's around it is in this parasha. However, as this is like we can say the least magical thing you can ever have, right? However, if we read the previous verses in Parashat Ito, last week's parasha, we realize the story, the story is talking about a story, is we're talking about Mount Sinai revelation, okay? And the revelation was very powerful, so we read in chapter 20, uh, verse, uh, let's see, 15. I'm going backwards, okay? Mm -hmm. Chapter 20, verse 15. Vechol ha'am roim et akolot. Talking about the amazing experience of Mount Sinai Revelation, an out-of-body experience of around 3 million people, okay? Mm -hmm. And then it says, verse 15, chapter 20, Vechol ha'am roim et akolot. The whole nation... The whole, not most, not some of, the whole nation see the voices. Vetalapidim and the torches. Veet kol shofar and they see the sound of the shofar. Vetar Hashem and the mount is smoking. Vayaram and the people got into awe. Vayanu vayamdu merchok and people stayed away. The experience was very, very overwhelming. Vayemuel Moshe, so verse 16, and they speak to Moshe, Daber ata imanu v'nishma v'al daber imanu Elohim penamut. We can't afford God talking to us more than that. We will die. It's too overwhelming. You talk to God, come back and tell us what you heard. Well, like for us, this is like, it's too much. Okay. Basically, we're talking about an unprecedented phenomenon in the history of mankind. Because, you know, religion starts, somebody gets into a cave, has a vision, he comes out, I have no religion. And he tells us the religion. And he, uh, if he's charismatic enough, you know, take it or leave it. You know, he had something, he had a vision. Here, it's not that someone came to the Israelites, and I had a, re a revelation, I had a dream, I had a, you know, everybody had it. Everybody was going through it. Now the question is, is that a lie? So the question is, when did the lie start? Hmm. You know, if you know Jewish people, you know, tell it, coming to someone and say, you know, our forefathers on Mount Sinai, they experienced, so my mom didn't tell me anything. My grandfather didn't say anything. Like, this is kind of awkward. Think about it. But here, as we said, there was an amazing experience. Not as kind of going, taking weeds or mushrooms and having an experience. The experience was beyond that. The experience was, first of all, as we read last week, that every, every as the Zohar said, the word was coming down from above and every person could witness the word coming down flying in the air, like could experience to see the word, right? To see the voices and could see multidimensionally, right? And like a treasure, that's what Zohar says, a treasure full of wisdom 
in each word and when the word was engraved in the tablet on the tablet 70 branches came out of it and from each branches 49 more branches came out of it what are we talking about so we said last week and this is highly important to understand because this is the sixth and the last week of the six weeks of Shovavim. We're having here an amazing transformation from a bunch of slaves. And we said before, being a slave is a state of mind. It's a definition of a mental capacity. Being a slave means you're not taking responsibility for anything. So, the easiest is to blame, take blame, guilt, be upset. Uh, all of those emotions do one thing. They fixate the fact that you are a slave. What does it mean? You have no responsibility whatsoever. Okay? Somebody else is in charge. What can I do? So, you can complain. Slaves complain. Winners, they make things happen. They don't have time to complain because there's so much thing to do. So much to do. Okay? So therefore we can ascend why from the ten, not commandments. Never said commandments. Dibot means utterances. Or as Azor says, advices. Hmm. The first one of them says, I'm the God, your Lord, that took you out from Egypt from the house of slavery. Where's the commandment over here? If you're talking about command, it's not a commandment. So what's the advice? If you look at it as an advice, oh, the advice says, I got you out of Egypt from the house of slavery. Agree? Don't agree. You know, you get an app. It's called the Torah app. On your phone. Now it's not on your phone. On Mount Sinai, you get the app on, in your brain and in your, into your heart. And in your mouth. Right? And then the first question, the first thing is, do you accept that you're not a slave anymore? Because the moment you accept that you're not a slave, you accept responsibility. That everything you do, you have to take total responsibility for the results. You can't blame anyone, you can't complain. You mess it up, fix it. Okay, you broke it, put it together. Okay? And complaining is not going to help anyone. Because that means you're not a slave. Why you're not a slave? Because the whole purpose of the creation was that man, humanity was created to be in the image of God. Creators. Creators is one side. Being a slave is the opposite side. So, being a slave, this is an option. It's not a viable option because... Choosing to be a slave will cost you a lot because that removes you away from what you really want to be deep inside. Every human being. Every human being. Being uh, emotionally unstable. That's being a slave. Oh, she said to me this and this and this. Okay, you're a slave because she overpowers you and she controls what you feel. Right? That's being a slave. Yeah, you're complaining again. Correct? Okay. He took away my job. He took away my book. He took away my whatever. Oh, so what are you going to do about it? Sitting complaining is not recognizing the feature, the image of God within you. Right? Are you a creator? Yes. So take what happened and create from it a new situation. That's what all of this is about. Nothing else. Nothing else. Oh, the stories. Different stories, different cover-up, but it's all cover-up for one story. Are you going to choose to be a slave or are you going to choose to be a creator? An independent, free human being who does it because that's the way you connect to the create to the endless light. Okay? So... When we say, when we speak about it, an, an experience like this, like seeing how the universe ticks, if you do this, that's what will happen. Or, 
if you do it differently, that will happen. And then you see all the possible options. And you see, if you did it this way on that time, the reaction will be that reaction. The following day, the following week, the following month, the following year, the following lifetime, and so on and so forth, till you come back to resolving the issue. What does it mean resolving the issue? You look at it as an opportunity to create your own life, your own enlightenment. That was it. So we're still on Mount Sinai because, listen carefully, the people say to Moses, go speak to God. We can't, we can't, we can't go on doing it. It was too much till now. Vayomer Moshe Elam, verse 17. And Moses said to the people, Al tirau, don't be in too much awe, ki levavur nasot etchem ba Elohim. God came to, you can read it as test you, but if you learn Zohar, to give you the opportunity to create a miracle. What's a miracle? You've been mortals till the moment of the uh, Mount Sinai revelation. On Mount Sinai, you became immortals. That's mm -hmm. a miracle. What do you mean you become an immortal? Just on a superficial level. Being immortal means you wake up in the morning, you think, you know what, this day, the sun is shining, it looks like it could be a nice day. And on the first opportunity, you allow something else to destroy your day. What happens when you allow something to destroy your day? And I use the word allow. You die a little bit. People say, oh, that killed me. That finished me off. That made me older in 10 years. That's called death. It's called death. Voluntarily, you accepted upon yourself death. And that can be like uh, 6.15 in the morning, and then again 7.24, and 8.10, and then 9.15, and then 10 o'clock, and you go on and you're just looking around, who's going to kill me now? Okay, let's embrace the killing. The world is awful, it is horrible, and we're here to die. And you like, that's a serial killing. But who's the killer? Your own self. You commit suicide again and again and again. And that's called to be immortal. Not that you die in the age of 110. Or 120. No. That you volunteer to die who knows how many times every day or an hour. By getting disappointed, getting upset, getting, uh, getting crazy and angry and all of that is simply... Assuming possession, position of, okay, I'm going to die again. And it's accumulating. It's accumulating. Listening to that first one that says, I am your God, your Lord, that took you out of the house of slavery. Agree or don't agree? Mm -hmm. When we say agree, it means I'm not, I'm taking responsibility. I'm not going to allow anyone and anything to kill me. At least I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to fight it. At least I'm going to fight it. So she was upsetting. He was not nice. That issue took my, the hope away from me. No, 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 no. They are not going to get the agenda, take over the agenda. My agenda is that I'm here. I woke up in the morning to become a creator. And that means... I woke up in the morning to experience immortality as many times possible every day. How do you experience immortality? Somebody comes to kill you and you say, you know what? Not today. Not today. It was a nice day till now. It's a nice day already. And it's going to be a nice day tomorrow. And your problem is, you know, I, I feel compassion to you, but I don't, I'm not going to jump with you into your hell. Because that's your hell, as long as you embrace it. But it's not my hell, because you know what? I'm really, really okay in my heaven, and I'm going to stay there. And no one is going to sell me his hell as a luxurious suite in a very, very big promising hotel. Or, a, you know what I'm saying? Mm. That's it. That is the agenda we're getting on Mount Sinai. The moment we accept that agenda... 
that moment will become immortal. Okay? That is an accumulating process. And when you really succumb to it, it's called aging. Called what? Aging. Oh, aging. Aging. And aging means, the Rabbi Ashlag says, giving up. Giving up. Okay, so now, understanding that, now remember what we said? Standing there on Mount Sinai and seeing that every action has a reaction. Every decision, that's what happens. The next stage and the next and the next stage. So you realize that the whole universe is like a clockwork. Nobody has an agenda but one. The agenda is how to take the person. After you did whatever you did, getting closer to your goal. Okay? And if you messed up, getting closer to your goal is put you in front of an opportunity to pay back to make what is called tikkun. Mm. And the result is, as we're standing still on Mount Sinai, okay? And this story that I just read is finished in verse 18. And the people stood afar. And Moses went into the cloud. Which means that God is there. I mean, God is only in the cloud. God is everywhere. However, Moses had to go to a place in which people's consciousness that could not take such an intensity are not there in, on the way. So Moses goes into seclusion for 40 days. What does he get during these 40 days? These are the laws you put in front of them. Which means the the Parashat Mishpatim is still an interesting part of the Mount Sinai experience. Part of everyone on Mount Sinai saw with his eyes. Okay? Now, and therefore, says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the Zohar speaks about it. Ela Mishpatim Asher Tosim Lifleim, these are the laws. Targum, okay, translation, these are the orders, which means the rules of reincarnation. Okay? These are the laws of souls that come back again and again to this world. And each one is being judged according to its own menu. Every soul has its own menu. Mm -hmm. This is what you did. This is this is the result. How? We just saw it. All the branching of possibilities of every mm -hmm. action a person can make from now on till the end of times. Okay. So, what do we get out of it? This is some... And I'm talking about... Okay, there was an amazing experience some 34 centuries ago. What's in it for me? I don't remember the experience. Okay? Yes, you do not remember, you should remind yourself because that, that is extremely important for your ability to get the most out of everything you go through in your own life. This is what this parasha is about. It's extremely important. And let me explain. Okay? So how do, we, how do we see that? What is the purpose of reincarnation? Okay? And the answer is very simple. Okay? Mm -hmm. The thought behind the creation is to share good with the creatures, us. We were created, therefore, with the desire to receive pleasure, bliss, and all that is good. Why? The creator is the source of all that is good, and he is not a creator unless somebody receives that good. Okay, so the existence of a, a creator necessitates the existence of someone who enjoys the creation. Okay, we were created the fir as the first customers. Okay, whose customers? We are his customers with a big H. Okay, now we were destined to enjoy, to be happy, and to get fulfilled. That's our destiny. 
can't argue with that. Okay? However, we know because we were created in his image, to remind all of us, in his image means that we are also wannabe creators. Okay? Which means we can't be dependent because the creator does not depend on anyone. Okay? So we prefer independence, whatever the cost will be. People who do not choose independence, they will. Because it's like they're disconnected from their own being. Another thing is being creative. The creator is creative. We love to be creative. So again, when people are not independent and are not creative, can't be happy. Mm -hmm. Because whatever joy they have is very high and by. It's very limited in time and, and scope. And the third one, the creator is the giver. We must be givers. Okay? So these three components, which means being independent. What do I mean being independent? No one will take over my agenda. I decided this morning is going to be an amazing day and nobody's going to take it. The moment somebody is taking over my agenda, okay, <clears throat> that's it. I lost my position as a creator. I became a slave. Nothing good can come out of it, okay? I just missed one round of an ability to make a miracle and become a creator, okay? Okay, wait a few minutes, the next round will come. Okay. So now. So as we said, in order for us to be creators, we need to earn it. Therefore, we have a body. The body is our biggest enemy. Mm -hmm. And our job is not to kill the body. Our job is to transform the body. To make it our best friend and supporter for reaching our goal to be creators okay getting rid of the body that's terrible you know people who just commit suicide mm -hmm. they got rid of the body why is it so terrible because just to remind in the 70s there was a little book a research Life After Life by Dr. Raymond, Raymond Moody. Okay? He was, he's a teacher of uh, literature and philosophy. And he started to analyze stories of students about near-death experience. And he, and he showed from stories of different people with no background about this kind of stuff. Which means they had no idea they're supposed to experience something like this. And from his stories came out the whole idea about what's near death experience because people get out of the body, fly through the tunnel, there's light in the end of the tunnel. It's like it, not all stories are exactly the same, but they're, they're, he was he's a researcher of literature. So he was researching the motives, and the motives repeat themselves in most of the stories. Okay? And most people's experience is when getting out of the body, reaching the light, and there's an amazing experience of warmth and love and promise. And, and then, my dear child, what is that you have to show me? And you start to feel ashamed. I wasn't busy becoming a creator. I was busy collecting money, possessions, all kinds of stuff, no matter what's the price. What have I done? What have I done? And I said, okay, my dear child, come go back and prove yourself. Okay? Now, all of these experiences were amazing. Except from the experiences of people who commit suicide. Who committed suicide and came back. Their experience is that after committing suicide, you know what's the problem? When you are in a body and you have mental anguish, you can always play with your phone, get a sleeping pill, right? Getting going, go out and eat something, and you are diverse, you are diverting the pain by getting yourself busy with something else. 
When you're dead, you know, have no body for the aversion. You can't go to sleep. You can't take a pill. You can't be busy with something. You can see the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And you realize you mess it up. You were supposed to overcome it, not to be succumbed by it, not just to be surrendered to the depression, the failure, whatever. You were supposed, and, you, and started, sometimes you even see how many times you're facing that anguish and you took your life instead of facing it and saying, this time, I'm going to be the creator. I'm going to put light into the darkness, hope into the anguish. I'm going to transform it. And here, you mess it up again. Now, who, how long will it take till you get the next opportunity? So the people who committed suicide, they, their story was horrific because the pain was so bad. Luckily, those ones were able to come back with a memory of how terrible it is to kill yourself. Most people kill themselves, they do a good job, and they don't come back. There's no way to come back to, okay? So this is why committing suicide means that you just said no to another opportunity. And now you'll have to wait for another lifetime, for another baby to be created that will fit your needs, and then you'll have to reach the same setup with the same anguish and pain and darkness and so on and you'll have to say let there be light and make light out of it so we need a body and that's why now we can understand the next verse verse 2 on chapter 21 remember we're in chapter 21 in exodus mm -hmm. these are the laws these are the rules of reincarnation when you buy a Hebrew slave, he will work for six years, and on the seventh he will come out to freedom for free. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, we do not have slavery today, even though if you look at the Torah, the slavery, the concept of slavery, the biblical concept, is nothing to do with the slavery we know, let's say, from the... Uh, uh, slavery of till the uh, civil war in America. A slave, if you go to the Talmud some 2,000 years ago, a little bit less, you get yourself a slave, you get yourself a master. Why? Because you robbed somebody and you wasted the money, then you were caught. You have to pay back. Why you have to pay back? Why do you have to pay back? Because you hurt somebody. And if you're not going to heal the pain, you or your soul is carrying that pain. Remember the branches. Mm -hmm. It's not, God, God, are you upset about me? God is not upset about you. So why do I feel that God is upset about me? Ah, because you created judgment. Do you remember Exodus? Parashat Mishpatim, Parashat Vaera. It was all about, hello, 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 guys. Don't put it on God. He loves you all. He loves you all the time. No matter what you do, unconditionally, that's a given. Now, what do you experience? This is what you superimpose on your experience with God. But there's nothing, no change in God. So you can experience God's judgment. God did not change. He was happy in the morning and now he's upset about you. Mm-mm-mm. No, 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 no. If you didn't realize that till now, the six week, so you missed the whole opportunity of the six weeks. It's all about reforging our consciousness. You are, if you are to be a creator, a co-creator, okay, you have to understand that the support of the creator himself, the creator, you are a creator, but the creator your, the support is unconditional. So why bad things happen to good people? And the answer is, even good people make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And even good people make mistakes, have to pay for it. Yeah, but God likes me. Maybe we'll forgive. 
Mm -mm -mm, says Rabbi Ezekloria, God cannot be bribed. Why? When we, when the world was created and everything was really perfect, everything was perfect. We didn't like it. Why? If everything is perfect and you, you have this nature of a co-creator, there's nothing to create. Boring. There's no one to give to. Frustrating. You cannot be independent. Everything was given to you. This is really annoying. Okay? So that's why the creator on the second day, on the first day, everything was perfect already. There was a night, there was a day, one day. One means there's no other. On the second day, the creator started to split. Read Genesis 1. He splits and he splits. Why? So we can put it together. How do you feel when you put it together for yourself and for others? Amazing. Baking a cake. You take all kinds of ingredients that are not edible. You put them together. It tastes edible. It's you that you made it. Wow. Right? Okay. You, uh, you take some issues that are broken or not operable and you fix it and now people use it. That's called having a job, okay? People pay you to do that, okay? So they have time to do it for others, okay? That's called having a job. So let's say you have a job, and instead of fixing it for people, you're messing it up for them. You're not doing your job. Very simple. You're not doing your job. Your job is to create light out of darkness, order out of chaos. That's called a job, okay? However... To make it real interesting, we were given a body. So, if we're talking about the superficial understanding of the parasha, being given a body means that you, when you make a mistake, okay, you, as we said, you steal from somebody, you're being caught. Court, that's what the Torah says, court, doesn't matter what court, Jewish or non-Jewish, must face you with a responsibility. You mess it up, you have to fix it. Okay? If you don't fix it, what will happen? You have to come another time to fix it. Because you have, you mess it up, you have to fix it. What is our job? To take chaos and to turn it into order. Right now you created more chaos than it used to be. Your job is to bring it back to order. You did not. Okay, you missed your opportunity. There will be another one coming. Okay? Court is supposed to make it shorter. Okay? Face you with the option. You have to fix it. Okay. This guy, you created the damage. Okay? You need to heal the damage because you created the damage. Do you have money to pay him for that? No. Wasted everything. Okay. We sell you as a slave. Who bought a slave like this? Only wise people with educational abilities because you just join what is called the foster family and a fast foster community what did we read last week in parasha tito it takes a village you want to create a spiritual life you want to create a life of a spiritual journey Never, never, ever count on do, being able to do it on your own. You need to be part of a community with these kind of values. Okay? Now, if somebody stole, he went off the derech, he went off the road, correct? Mm -hmm. So if you just get him aligned to be a part of a family, okay, with high values, and this family is part of a community, with these values, well, what will happen within six years? You become an apprentice and you become part of the community. You are going to little by little come to your senses. That is the purpose. However, if they throw you, let's say, to an American, Israeli, European jail, who are you going to meet in jail? <laughs> People that their values are not so healthy. You know, I'm talking about probabilities. Most of the probabilities is that in jail, you're the society that will 
you will assimilate in in order to survive have different kind of rules okay it's not something that society can afford because the more people you send to jail you have more people that have sick wrong values and we know how easy it is for most people <clears throat> to turn from being polite nice people the moment you change the values of the society poof 90 percent just like this in order to survive they they um they surrender to the worst kind of values talking about nazi germany most of the germans in 1933 were totally anti all what was Nazi. 1938, 90% of the Germans were already Nazis. Why? Psychologically, everybody wants to survive. So you go with the flow. With the with the with the flow, you go with the herd, and that's what happens to people. You send a person that fell, tripped, he stole, he robbed, you know, he just got confused. That's not his values. That's not what he wants to be. But now you send him to jail. He's going to adopt the values over there just for survival. And it's over. Now try to get him back. Now try to get him back. Not as long as he's part of... Now he knows his people. These are his friends. These are the people when he leaves jail. He's going to look for people like that. What are you for? Well, what's happening right now? Society will have to pay for it dearly, and it's pain. Okay, you have to find a foster home for a person like this, says the Torah, because the problem that he's thinking is sick, his consciousness is sick. That's why he committed the crime. Okay, so the first thing is to fix the soul and to make sure by paying back to the victim, and second. To re-educate the person with new values, with a healthy environment. Okay? So as again we say, you want to become a spiritual person and to do your tikkun, which means to follow the calling that you came to this world for, don't hang out with people that don't even, don't even have an idea what I just said. They're just here to take as much as they can and to get by with it. This is not where you want to be, okay? Oh, but you see a lot of people, they hang out with this kind of people and they are criminals and they rob and they steal and they cheat and whatever and they have a lot of money and they just have fun. Fun? When you see their lives on Facebook or the movies, newspapers, they don't tell you about the antidepressants they take. They don't take, tell you about their addiction to all kinds of other medication and stuff like this. They don't tell you about the rage they have, the psychotic uh, mentality. You, they don't tell you about that. Why? It's look good. It looks good. Why, why is it looking good? Ah. When you... So the Zohar says, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, Friends, it's a time to tell some hidden secrets of reincarnation. You can look at it, you buying a Hebrew slave as an educational way we just said. Or you can look at it in a deeper level. Every person coming to this world, it's a soul coming into a body to be enslaved to the body. Hmm. That's a Hebrew slave. Being a slave to the body, because you can see only what your body allows you to see. Mm -hmm. Okay? You can feel only what your heart allows you to feel. You think and visualize whatever your body allows you. And your job is to overcome that, because there are no free lunches. You want to be godly? You have to overcome your opponent. Who's your opponent? It's not your neighbor, not your wife, not your husband, not your children, not your partner in business, not your clients. 
or your suppliers or the politicians. Neither of these is your enemy. Your own body consciousness is your only enemy. Okay? And you are not supposed to destroy your enemy. You're supposed to get him on your side. Wow. No compromises. You have to get him on your side. And you love the Lord your God with your both hearts. The good and the not so good. And you have to turn the desire to receive for the self alone into the desire to receive for the sake of sharing. And it's not because God hates you or is upset about you. Whatever. The way you perceive reality is exactly the spitting image of your status of your tikkun process. Mm. So when you see that the whole world hates you, okay, you have a tikkun with learning how to appreciate what is good and achieving total optimism because God loves you. How? So, remember we said many times, the law is like this. The Creator created us so we can be happy, remember? Yep. What if we're not happy? Mission not accomplished. What does that mean? Surrounding light. Remember the roads, mm -hmm. the tree? There's going to be some forces. Not gravity, not electrical, but the real forces of this universe that will push you, surround you, to the next stage in which you have to face the miracle. What's the miracle? You overcome the discomfort and you replace it with faith. Replace it with optimism. Replace it with, I know it's going to be good and I have to make it good. And I take the whole, the whole responsibility for that to become good. Okay? Now, what do we do with that? If it's not what it says, if the end is well, all is well. But if it's not well, it's not the end. So, you read in uh, Samuel 1, chapter 14, verse 14, and it says that no one will ever be casted away from him. What does it mean? Mm. You can't mess enough so God will throw you away to rot in hell forever. That's not even an option. Oh, God hates me. I don't know why he's angry about me. I'm hopeless, whatever. That's not an option. Get on your feet and try all over again. No, but... Mm -mm -mm. You're going to be a creator and you're going to get all of that light and we have no time. Let's move it. You're a slave or not a slave? Okay, you want to get out of slavery? Here it is. Okay, that's why we go back into the... So Rabbi Shimon says, when the soul comes back again, because last time you finished your life, it was not so well. That's why you had to come again. That's why, why, and nobody here is the first time. Okay? No one here is the first time, not even you and me. Okay, and you and you. So if we're not the first time, so we, it was not that great in a past life. Okay, that's why we came all over again. To improve it. So, when the soul needs to come in another lifetime, now what are the reasons? Okay, either because of transgressions. Okay, you messed something up. Now you came, you didn't fix it in past life. You have to come. Don't worry. The universe has time. Come another time. We'll give you the options. Okay? You didn't do it this time. Next time. Okay? The problem is we don't have so much time left. But still, people are doing it. They are really right in a rush. You know why everybody's in a rush? All seven and a half billion people on earth? Because deep inside, everybody knows there's not so much time left. Okay? So people are rushing to get it done before time is up. Now, what the, one reason is to fix stuff. Another reason is to 
complete with Torah and mitzvot. What means to complete yourself with Torah and mitzvot? If you're Jewish, there's 613 mitzvot. If you're not Jewish, you have, it's not seven, seven Noahide, they are really in our scale, it's about almost 70. Okay? What are the mitzvot? These are the rules that you have to learn how to connect to joy legally without hurting yourself and without hurting others. You know, in the beginning it's tough. But you know, let's say somebody really wants to be in shape. <coughs> he goes to the gym and he's starting to work out. But he doesn't know the rules. And sooner or later he starts to tear ligaments, break bones. He's really into it. But he doesn't know the rules. So he hurts himself. Okay? Do you enjoy it when you work out and you don't know how to do it right? Yeah. No. You're in total anguish and pain. However, when you know the rules and you understand human anatomy and how the muscles are built and you exercise properly, you enjoy it. You enjoy it because you feel better and you feel better all the time. So knowing the rules is part of being happy. You cannot be excited and happy about life and being in the ignoramus in the same time. Impossible. Impossible. You need to study and to learn what are the rules in order to be able to get the best out of this, what is called life. Didn't do it. Next time. Okay? Then, because when the soul comes into a body, only then you can do tikkun. Only then you can fix yourself. Mm-hmm. Ah, so that's, and the body has its own agenda. That's becoming a slave. You hear what the body hears. You smell what the body smells. You taste what the body tastes. And you have all kinds of hormonal, you know, stuff. If you're male, testosterone and stuff like this, endorphins, adrenaline, Female, it's like uh, progesterone, all of that stuff that drives you crazy so you can tame it. Right? Like taming a stallion or an ox. Okay? After you tame them, oh, you can do a lot of work with them. But if you don't tame them, oh, that could be really, really dangerous for all around. That's the story of mankind. Okay? So now, we are coming into a body because Rabbi Isaac Luria from here tells us and explains to us, you can make a tikkun only within a body. Why are we coming back again and again? Most of the time you don't like it. Because outside the body, you know everything. No obstacles, no opportunities. You cannot turn darkness into light. You cannot turn bitterness into sweet. You, can ter- you cannot turn confusion into certainty. You cannot turn broken stuff into complete stuff. You cannot turn this connection into connection. So there's no real fulfillment because there's nothing to create. Okay? Mm. So you need a body to make a tikkun. Even the, the sages are saying, let's say somebody passed away. He had an amazing spiritual life. Okay? Mm-hmm. He had the total control over the body. He did everything right. He was always spiritual. He made money always honestly. He, everything he did was within the rules. And then he comes to heaven and he gets his place in heaven. Then he realizes there are higher levels. And he's asking, like, why am I, am I not there? And they tell him, you know, they worked harder than you did. So how do how can I get there? Oh, you have to come back into a body. So although the person is totally spiritually complete and righteous, but you know, there's a difference between being okay than having life that is hilariously amazing, right? By what? More effort, more overcoming 
obstacles and doing it with more fire and enthusiasm. Correct? Okay, so you want to go there? Okay, come back again. And you come back again, you get another body, and then you start all over. What if somebody completed his tikkun, except for a few little things? Let's say it says somebody, let's say, uh, let's talk about Jews. Okay, somebody completed his tikkun. However, he never performed Pidyon Aben, the redemption of the firstborn. Why? A few lifetimes he was a Kohen. So you cannot have a Pidyon Aben. Sometimes you've been a Levi, a Levite, no Pidyon Aben. Sometimes you were married to a Kohen or a Levite wife. And sometimes you just, the other times, you were just a regular Israelite, but the firstborn was a girl. Coming down another lifetime in a body just for that, the system doesn't allow that. That's too costly. So what do you do? So you. You wait till someone that his soul is really close to you in the tree of life. Remember mm -hmm. those branches? Every soul comes from another place. Every soul has a different calling, a different job. Okay? So you're waiting till someone that is close to you on the tree of life is going to have his own redemption of the firstborn because he's not a Levite, not a Kohen. His wife gave birth, it's a first child, it's a girl, it's a boy, it was the first pregnancy. And it was not a Caesarean. Now you can enter, walk into that guy and experience it with him. And this is called an Ibu. Mm. This is an Ibu that a higher soul comes into a person in his body together with him to experience something and to experience a fulfillment of a mitzvah that you didn't have time to do it. It never happened to you. Okay? Mm. This kind of Ibur is Ibur for its own sake. Which means that soul came in. However, when another soul walks into you to participate positively, it's called Ibur. I-B-U-R. Or in Hebrew, Ein Bet Vavresh. Okay? Now, of course that you get some help. Because sometimes you get that Ibu without doing such a mitzvah. You're going through a hard time in life and you're really, really facing that obstacle that you have no idea how to do it and you do the right thing, which is, I have to do it. I have to create my own life. There's no option to fail. I'll do it no matter what. You jump into it with all the zest, with all the power, with all the faith that you're not going to be th thrown under the bus. You go through this opportunity, you look backwards and you say, wow, was that me? I did things I never knew I can do it. I figured out stuff there's no way in the world I could figure it out. How did that happen? Another higher soul walked into you called an Ibu. Why it's called Ibu pregnancy? Because pregnant woman, she has another one inside her, right? You have another soul inside you. That soul came to support you just because you wanted so hard. Just because you created a miracle. What's the miracle? Your body said to you, no way you can't do it. It's impossible. Nobody ever... And you just said, there must be a way. If there's a will, there's a way. How could that be? It's against logic. Who said logic is right? Thousands of years, people said there's no logic, that people can fly. Everybody flies right now with airplanes. Correct? Yep. Okay. That's against logic. It defies logic. Okay, is it the only thing that defies logic? A lot of stuff, right? So, that's not a proof. It's not logical. That's not a proof. It's not the first time it's not logical. It's not the first time people overcome challenges in their life against logic. You just believe that God is not going to let you go without a solution. So you go for it. And you know what happens? Another soul walks into you. Now you have another soul. And when it comes into you, 
it comes with the consciousness it had before and suddenly you know you're like in shock i know how to open that door i know how to figure out this problem how do i know that i never learned that and you do it naturally now you know how to do it because you did it already where did the knowledge come from from that soul that came into you why would that soul come into me they just want to help you because remember we spoke about it souls of the same part of the tree of life they it's like a football team everybody wants it's a teamwork when somebody is la- is 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 left behind everybody else it cannot move on so everybody has an interest to push you forward you get ibu hmm. and most of us or most of our uh, you know neighbors in the tree of life already finished long time ago hmm. so they cheerleaders like go 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 we'll come into you you just need to show a will okay they these are the kinds of ibu we have sometimes we have something else when a bad when a soul that is loaded with negativity remember mm. you can fix correct only in the body what if somebody dies and his soul is loaded with so much negativity he can't go back into a body it's too much he cannot go to hell because hell you know purgatory the jewish concept of purgatory is like detailing place it's only for people who like have little to fix and that's worth it to go to send them back into this world and always you have you know it's like this is a physical world you always make mistakes so like the last touch-ups you go over there for limited time then you go to heaven it's over okay can't go to he- to purgatory so what so where you stuck in between worlds this is the worst you know who you are you know what you messed up and there's no way you can go nobody accepts you one way is left you can fix only in a body you're looking for a loophole you're looking for a gate to get into a human being but you can go into human being just like this oh yes you can if they invite you how can they invite you oh Ouija board people try to connect whatever they takes a drug mushroom stuff they want to connect to the universe hello <laughs> the universe is not all friendly there's also some parts of the universe that are not so nice you don't want to be anything in relationship with that part of the universe but you invite it in who will come in high spiritual great souls you can't tell them where to come so we'll come in those miserable ones who are waiting for someone to open the door and then you know you had an amazing evening with your friends and you played mystical stuff and then you want to go home because you have to get up for work and you tell this uh, soul okay go back to your place yeah funny i mean to i found the place and why is it always horrible because when you go through suffering in your body they get fixed <laughs> they have an interest that you go through miserable stuff and now because you invited it can't complain don't do that don't invite these kind of entities because not all the souls hanging there are really cute and nice okay mm-hmm. you don't do that okay what about other gates yeah people can open a gate and lose protection when they get very angry and they start to curse and they start to really bad mouth and they start to really say bad words about the creation about you know all kinds of entities in the universe oh you called me I'm here whoops now try to get rid of it or being in a terrible depression and believing in it and letting it control you you lose protection if you that's why you see a lot of people that go through this anger stuff depression stuff and then they have mental issues forever 
could be souls coming into it. But this time it's not called Ibur. Ibur is only positive souls. And by the way, you lose the Ibur the moment you make it uncomfortable. They're not here to be to suffer. So when a person gets angry and get upset and miserable or whatever, they leave. We, we didn't come over here to, to suffer. We had enough. Okay, our job is finished. You don't want us? We're going. The other side... The negative souls are looking for a place to stick in. How do you say to stick in Hebrew? Read the back. The book. It's called the book. The book. Okay. So, understanding that, we have a whole setup of system of rules about reincarnation. And again, what is it all about? Remember, if the end is well, all is well. If it's not well, it's not the end. If somebody died miserable and upset and angry and frustrated, whatever, he'll have to come again. Because the end, it was not well. Mm -hmm. So it's not the end. And because nobody will be cast away forever, you'll have to come and do it again and again. Now, now so now we can go through the whole Parashat of Mishpatim and see it's all about rules of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Let's say an example. Somebody worked in a, in a city, municipality. He was responsible for the sidewalks. Okay? He didn't do a good job. There were so many potholes. People were like again and again, broke a leg, broke a head, broke a bone, here and there and forth. And the guy got a salary. He got all the budgets. He simply didn't do it. Okay? Mm-hmm. He could come, you know, but it says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a leg for a leg, a hand for a head. Okay? So, he could come next lifetime and as an orthopedic doctor. He has to put together broken bones. <laughs> and he'll be busy at work, running like crazy, shifts and more shifts and more shifts. No time for family, no time for that. And he has a calling, he knows he has to do it. Why? You're responsible for breaking so many people's bones. Now your job is to fix it. What if you don't fix it? What if you do a bad job? Again. No, now you break bones and go from one doctor to another that they will fix it for you. You already got your first time like, to do it. Now, till you realize how terrible it is to break bones all the time. Okay, maybe this. Uh, it's all cause and effect. Mm -hmm. It's nothing that God is against us. It's, this is the learning of the six weeks. It's all about the tikkun. It's all about taking responsibility. It's all about realizing that we are here to learn not to be slaves. So now, we'll skip you uh Verses about soulmates, you know, if your master gave you a soul, a, a soulmate, then when you leave slavery, you, she stays in the slavery. What if somebody comes with his soulmate? You go with your soulmate one lifetime and another. But what if she finished the job and you didn't? You have to come again. Women, okay. says Rabbi Azaklura, they come one time is enough. The giving, the sharing, the spirituality, whatever. Whatever they do, going to purgatory is enough. They go to heaven, having a big party in one of the <laughs> big areas in heaven. It's like amazing stuff. They're having like an amazing life over there. You read in the Zohar and other places. And then you get a WhatsApp. Hello? Okay, your, your soulmate is, have to, is going to be reborn and he needs you. Are you coming? And the Zohar says... It's her choice. Ladies, if you are here, it's because you said yes. <laughs> but if, says the Zohar, if the woman is there in heaven, she says, you know what? I came down with him once, twice, three, four, five, eight times. He's not changing. He's so deep in his, his nonsense. I'm not coming. I'm not. I'm staying here till he shows some. Did you ever realize that who wants really to get married? The women. Why? 
Where's the bum? I came over here for him. Okay, where is he? When I find him, he's got like, where is he? And the man is like, I don't know. I don't want to commit. <laughs> I have to need, I need the, my freedom. I get some more time. Hello. And that's why, according to the Torah, a woman does not have to get married and have children to fix her tikkun. A man must. Okay? Must. So then the Torah says, so what if she said, you know, even God by himself cannot force her to come down. He comes down wifeless. So his master will give him somebody else. Somebody who came down for her soulmate, but he's not even close to understand what the whole thing is about. She says, I, you know, I'm not good for him. I'm not good for him. Okay, I'm already here. Is there any job? God says, yes, this is this guy, wifeless. Take over him. Okay? Now she starts, okay, we have a job. We have a project. We have a man. He has no idea what is he here for. He, the guy has no sense for anything of sharing, giving, growing spiritually, taking responsibility. The guy sits in front of the TV, complains all the time, blames this one, blames the government, blames that, doesn't take... Somebody has to get him moving. After they, she, after they die, she doesn't continue with him. She was not his soulmate in the first place. She was just a loner. Okay? That the creator, his master, gave him. Okay, you get one for a loan for this lifetime. Or for a few years till the divorce. But what if you didn't do the job? So you marry another one like this. And another one. Till you start to realize what's the name of the game. Okay? Let's skip a lot of sentences and verses because there's so much into it. It's a whole course of reincarnation you can find on the site. Okay? But... But this is like very important. Verse 28, chapter 21. What happens if an ox gores a man or a woman and kill them? The ox will be stoned to death and the owner of the ox is clean. He just said the loss of the ox. But what if the ox did it again? Hmm. Now the owner of the ox is totally responsible. And now that opens another story and that we go to the Zohar in the Perusha Sulam. Uh, verse 445, I'm sorry. 445. Get up now. Moses is now coming to the group of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai to discuss this really important issue. It's all the laws of damages. All the laws of damages. In that name of Yud K Vav K, which are, which is the chariot of Ezekiel, a lion. An ox, an eagle, and men. Four holy beasts. The, the ox is judgment. And that's why the story starts with an ox. Why would... So, but you own an ox? No. No. So why do you have to learn about it? Because we all have judgment. And that's the ox. And when we're in judgment, we have the tendency to hurt other people too. And we hurt other people, we have to take responsibility for that. And if we don't take responsibility for that, then court has to face us with the truth. And if we run away from court, then life will have to face us. So all of these laws are cosmic laws. As we said, when it said on Mount Sinai, do not steal. What was the thing? The Mesopotamian Chaburabi laws said do not steal. The Egyptian laws said do not steal. Uh -uh. It says, no one is supposed to steal but us, the king. Mm. I'm the king. I'm the only one who's stealing over here. I'm the only one who's taking... You have to remember, 
This is 25 centuries before the Magna Carta. Mount Sinai revelation was the Magna Carta for mankind, but in a bigger scale, on a soul level. Every human being has the right for his happiness, for his property, for his belongings, for his freedom. No one is allowed to take it away without consequences. If you allow people to take it away from you, there are consequences for that too. Okay? You could choose to be a slave, you could choose to be a master. That's your. But no one is above the law, even the king. That's why, according to the Torah laws, the king has to write the whole Torah by himself. And then he should go around everywhere with the Torah. To know, to remember. It's the law. You're just a civil servant. When was that arrived to the world? 1215 in England? No, Mount Sinai. Do not steal, it means do not steal. Period. Yeah, but I am the king. So, you're a human being and you can't. Everybody was made in the image of the creator. You too, yes, but you don't have subjects. You have citizens. The idea was formed here the first time. And that means that you have no way, any right, to inflict a damage on any scale on any other person. The rules are here. These are the rules, and the rules have many levels. And that's why that the rules are divided here and in the Talmud and all, you know, the, into few sections. And they're called, these are the rules of four. It's always four. Why four? Yud, K, Vav, K. Four options. Okay? And these are the rules of damage and the rule of the shul, the ox. Always the four because that's the beginning. Okay? Vehabol. Okay? You left a pothole and somebody fell into it. You'll have to pay the damage because you are the cause. Okay? Vehamav A. Your cow. You have a pet cow. You loved your cow. Instead of dogs, cows are nicer than dogs. You know, some people... Okay, but your cow, the, you know, the gate was open. And your cow ran away and ate all the flour in your neighbor's garden. You have to pay for it because it's your cow. Okay? Again, what if your cow ran on the street and just your neighbor took out all the, all the crystals just to wash them and to clean them in the sun, and the cow ran through it and broke them. You have to pay that. All of that stuff, you remember, to the details, means whatever damage you inflict on somebody else, you have to pay. It's a karma. These are the rules of the universe. It's not because God hates you. Grow up already. You awaken judgment in the world that judgment is coming at you and you have to transform it and say, okay, I'm paying because I have to, because I know I want to cleanse myself. Not because I want God to love me again. He always loves you. He gives you the opportunity to pay back so you don't owe anything anymore. He even sends you to be a doctor so you can pay back. He gives you the brain, the patience, the ability. Can everybody be a surgeon of bones? I know some people, it's like they're born into it. The main, it's like they're programmed from birth to do that. And most people, for, it's like, what? I, I can't even cut myself without fainting. To talk about cutting somebody else's bones, like with, with, a, so. with a saw, I, wow. I never recuperate. <laughs> some people, they do it naturally. I had a student, he could do it, he was surging, doing surgery with eyes closed. He could simply feel everything and do it so fast. He was born for that. How many bones he broke in his past life? I don't know. <laughs> okay? Could be. So, the f so, we had an ox, which means something that belongs to you to harass somebody else. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
you created something. What about the many laws? Or what about pollution? You had a factory. That pollution went into the water, into the food. So many people got cancer out of it. That's a heavy karmic death. The Torah talks about all of this stuff. Okay? Nothing is left aside. Why do you have so many volumes of the Talmud? It's how the damage is being defined and how do you fix it? Because you don't want to come in another lifetime. You want to make a shortcut. You want to fix it beforehand. Okay. And then, and that's what's amazing. It says all of that. says Azor, uh, verse 446. Kumi Torah Bedinim. Wake up with the judgment. Because here we're studying all the judgment that human beings can create. And how to transform them. That's our job. Not to say, oh, there's so much judgment, the world is so terrible, I give up. No, giving up is not an option. You'll have to face it all over again till you overcome it. Okay? You have to take responsibility also for the judgments you created, not just the ones around you. Says Moses, God opened my mouth. That's English. In Hebrew, it's Adonai, Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud. Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud. Be'ipuch, Otiyot, Dina. You change the order of the letter, it's Dina, judgment. And we said, when you look at the name, you arouse the judgment, the name of God of judgment, that's what you experience. But who awakened it? You. Who has to take responsibility for that? You. Who can sweeten it into mercy? Only you. Because it's your judgment. It's nobody else's judgment. Yeah, but I'm feeling horrible. It's because of them. Like, how do you feel? Horrible. What feeling horrible is about? Judgment. Who does that belong to? You. To you. Why? You allowed it in. So it's yours. Why? It never happened to you. You see somebody else going through a horrible, horrible, terrible time you just can feel compassion towards that person that's an option you don't have to see somebody else doing something wrong and to feel bad about it it's only one option you can ignore you can feel compassion the fact that somebody else is making a mistake it doesn't mean that you feel the judgment if you feel the judgment means that's part of your responsibility to overturn and that's why it says in that Mishnah, you know, there is the Torah. And there are all the branches, remember? The branches are not in the Torah. The branches were the oral Torah, given also Mount Sinai. It went by orally from Moses to Joshua, from Joshua to the elders, from the elders to the prophets, to the, to the judges, and then the prophets. All the prophets, and then to the Knesset Gdola, then to the Tanaim. This is, it's called the chain. In the beginning of Ethics of the Fathers, you get the whole list. There was a stage, they were afraid it's going to get lost, and they wrote it down. Stage one, Mishnah. Stage two, Talmud. I'm sorry, I skipped one, Mishnah and the Zohar. Because they knew after a while people won't be able to read in between the lines in the Talmud. So they wrote the Zohar so we can get access of what the whole thing is really about. Is it about an ox? No, it's about judgment. You awaken judgment, you have to take responsibility for it. You're not, it's going to come after you. Not because God hates you. It's a, your judgment to take care of. Hmm. And that's why it says, Dina de Malchuta Dina, in the Mishnah. Dina, judgment, of Malchut. What is Malchut? This world. Any, this world, what does it mean? Rulership. Kingdom is also Malchut. What is a kingdom? When there are rules of the king, and he can't just do whatever you want. That's kingdom. Right? This world is the kingdom of the creator. What does it mean? There are rules. You like it or not, you have to go by the rules. After a while, you realize these rules were for you. 
on for your favor but when you don't like the rules because you don't understand them you don't in, internalize them then you just why bother why why i can't eat all the sugar in the world why can't i eat all the fat in the world why can't why can't i just eat ice cream all the time it's not good for you this is the rule you need vitamins you need this you can't just eat hamburger you know you can't you have to eat the food that your body was built to take you have a problem with that sorry can't change the rules right now this is dina the malchuta dina same thing on everything else you want to be happy you want to be you to feel free you have to care for people people's bodies people's property people uh, domain whatever you have to be responsible for that too can't just hurt everybody and and then i understand why my life is so horrible this mm -hmm. karma okay so all of these judgments this is what we're talking about so all of these rules when you understand the rules you basically learn how to understand yourself in order again to transform negativity into positivity and that's the whole story when you have that consciousness you're ready to become the person you're supposed to be hmm. and that's what these six weeks were about one week to go to this thank you so much